Okay, guys. Good to have you here. Chapter seven, we begin next. Microbial nutrition, ecology, and growth. We'll break this up probably into two uh, lectures like we've done in the, for the past few chapters. So some of you have taken nutrition. Um, it used to be a required course for the nursing curriculum, but I think it's now uh, been sort of demoted, if you will, to an optional course, but certainly a lot of students still take nutrition. Um, we're talking here, of course, about nutrition as it applies to microbes. But a lot of what we're gonna talk about in the next few minutes could be equally applied to eukaryotic cells as well. So there are some differences as we already know between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, but they do share some similar nutritional requirements. But again, there are differences. One, um, commonality between eukaryotic and prokaryotic nutritional requirements uh, boils down to the fact that all cells need essential nutrients in order to survive and reproduce and do everything that cells need to do. And some of these nu nutrients are required in larger quantities. We call them macronutrients. The prefix macro, of course, referring to large, needed for the synthesis of important cellular structures like peptidoglycan perhaps, which we know is an integral part of the cell wall of many bacteria. And within that peptidoglycan is a protein component and a carbohydrate component. So in order for a bacterial cell to undergo division and create two new daughter cells, it has to be able to synthesize adequate peptidoglycan and they would therefore need those cells. Um, particular compounds in large quantities, because as we know, this is a pretty darn important structure for a cell, the peptidoglycan. Um, micronutrients or trace elements, as the first uh, term sort of implies, are needed in much smaller concentrations. That is not to diminish the importance of these particular micronutrients, because without them, a cell could run into major, major issues, could die theoretically, if it, have if it did not have adequate um, trace elements that it, that it needs for enzymatic action or biochemical pathways. And a lot of these um, micronutrients and trace elements many times are certain types of metals. And you see those listed there at the bottom um, of this slide. If you just think, for example, of like iron, we require iron in small concentrations for our hemoglobin. If you think back to ANP1, well, without hemoglobin, blood cells, red blood cells couldn't transport oxygen. And so in a similar sort of vein, many prokaryotes need these sorts of elements, metals oftentimes, for certain important critical cellular function. Just kind of think of it with regard to um, the iron analogy in, in our cells. Don't need much of it, but if we run out of it, we can run into issues as can prokaryotic cells. We're also going to clearly define, and you should have heard about this when you uh, studied chemistry, the difference between organic and inorganic compounds. And here we're again talking about nutrients. So these are things that cells need. Organic nutrients or organic compounds are compounds that have a lot of carbon and hydrogen in their atomic structure. And you can think of the major organic groups of molecules, which you see listed there, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. These are organic. They have a lot of carbon and a lot of hydrogen generally in their chemical structure. Now, you do see listed there CH4 or methane. This is a gas. Uh, it doesn't have a heck of a lot of carbon, just one carbon atom and four hydrogens that are covalently bonded to that carbon. So we can talk about more simplistic examples of organic nutrients like, like methane. Um, but oftentimes when we think of organic, we're thinking of big macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and that kind of thing. Inorganic simply means that these compounds lack much in the way of carbon and hydrogen. 
In fact, they may not even have any of those two elements in their chemical structure. And there you see listed a couple of different types of salts. You're familiar with sodium chloride, NaCl, but that's just one of many, many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of salts. Um, you don't need to memorize the name and the chemistry of these salts, but again, if you just take a look at them, you'll see that there is no hydrogen, there is no carbon. Now CO2, you might say, well, that's a gas that has a carbon atom in it, and you're right, it does, but it's not considered organic. Even though there is a carbon there, um, there's no hydrogens and there's not enough carbon to, for it to be considered organic. So it would be, of course, inorganic. And water, we all know H2O, an important constituent of cells, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Um, that is probably the most abundant inorganic compound in cells. Speaking of cells, we again said that water is a big component. 70% of a given cell, be it a eukaryotic or prokaryotic cell, has water in it, with proteins being the most abundant type of organic compound. Many of these proteins are structural proteins. Many of them um, provide uh, an important role as enzymes in biochemical pathways. All enzymes are proteins. So just kind of think about you know, what's in a cell wall, what's in a cell membrane of a prokaryote. Uh, you've got to have those embedded proteins, right? Within the peptidoglycan or within the, the uh, cell membrane that helps to regulate movement of materials across the cell. So they're absolutely crucial. When we look at those organic compounds that we find in cells, these six elements that you see listed there are making up almost 100% of the elements within and among all the compounds that make up a cell. And actually, these six elements are also the most abundant in eukaryotic cells as well. So CHOPSIN is sort of the acronym that you might want to think about as you uh, remember those six elements. Here we're looking at a table that lists, again, many of the uh, most abundant um, elements. There's CHOPSIN at the top, of course, and you can see there listed some of the sources of those particular six elements and their importance within cells. Um, toward the bottom of the list, we run into some of the micronutrients and the trace elements there, which we mentioned a few moments ago, um, should not be thought of as unimportant. They are absolutely critical, but you just don't need them in very high concentrations if you're a prokaryotic cell or eukaryotic cell. Um, so I am not asking you to memorize this table. I just think it's helpful to peruse it, go down through, um, the various uh, nutrient forms there, the different elements. Um, read over like where where do you find these in the in the world? And finally, what are some important functions that some of these elements might have within a cell? Oftentimes, we can talk about microbial nutrition and the role that growth factors play in that very broad topic. So we're talking here about a group of generally organic substances that the cell itself cannot make its, by, its, by its own genetic capabilities. In other words, we know that some cells can make their own proteins, their own carbohydrates, their own lipids and so forth because they have the instruction booklet, if you will, within the DNA. So you can synthesize many, many organic compounds because you have in your 46 chromosomes the necessary uh, instruction booklets. Well, in a bacterial cell and, and also in our cells too, um, we don't have that capability or those cells don't have that capability. So they have to be able to obtain these from an outside source in some way and oftentimes as we'll talk about in a few moments, cells um, will have to assimilate food. They'll have to bring it in to their cellular structure and then utilize that nutrient as um, a growth factor, we call it. 
So these are important in the growth of the cells. They can't make it themselves. Um, so they have to assimilate it. They have to bring it in um, and then use those building block elements to comprise and compose, chemically produce the necessary growth factors that are absolutely critical for the growth of the cell. We're going to talk next about how a prokaryote obtains its source of energy as well as how it obtains, obtains its own carbon. Now we know that all cells, if they run out of energy, will die, right? We've stressed that in ANP. You should understand, of course, that basic concept. The same would apply for prokaryotic cells. How do they make energy? How do they get energy? Because the energy is going to, going to allow that cell to make bigger, more complex molecules. We call that anabolic pathways, those or anabolism. Again, think back, ANP1. Um, but cells don't always get their energy as a result of breaking down organic compounds. As you're going to find out in a few moments, there are some cells that can get energy from the outside too, from external sources. And we'll also talk about how cells obtain carbon. Why would cells need carbon? Well, we just learned that carbon is an important element in the construction of organic compounds, many of which are macronutrients, right? Needed for the cell to make all sorts of molecules. So as a cell, you had better have a way to obtain your carbon. Sometimes that can be done by assimilating and ingesting and eating food, if you will. But other cells have evolved very unique uh, ways of obtaining their carbon besides assimilating food. And again, if you think about this um, a little bit, I'm sure you can come up with some, some alternative pathways that certain cells might be able to make use of. Well, we're gonna review that next. So let's talk first about energy. How does a cell get energy? So we're introduce, going to introduce some terms here, including this first one, chemotroph, a chemotrophic cell. Well, a chemotroph, as it mentions here, is going to get its energy from compounds that it, it utilizes in some way. Compare and contrast that mode of, of, of energy um, uh, maintenance, or not maintenance, but uh, ob obtaining that energy via chemical compounds with this group of cells called phototrophic cells, which are gonna get their energy not from chemical compounds, but rather from the sun, right? You know that plants, for example, are phototrophic. Without light, plants cannot survive. They die. You can't grow a plant in the dark. You need sunshine or artificial light sources to grow that plant. And then what that phototrophic plant cell will do is take that energy from the sun and utilize it in the process we know as photosynthesis, which is the creation of new buds, new roots, new leaves, maybe flowers, maybe fruit, right? The plant grows. But it got that energy again from the sun, as opposed to a chemotroph that is getting its energy from some chemical compound. We also want to talk about, again, how cells get their carbon. Because without it, they can't make organic compounds. A heterotrophic organism or heterotrophic cell is going to get its carbon from other living organisms, generally. We could probably even cross out living in that definition because there are some heterotrophic cells that live off of dead, decaying organisms to get their organic building block molecules. So generally, they're eating living things, but it doesn't always have to be living. Autotrophic, 
organisms or cells are getting their carbon not from assimilating or quote unquote eating food, but rather are utilizing carbon dioxide in the environment as a carbon source that they will then use to make proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids of their own. And so these particular cell types have really unique ways of doing so. They don't rely on dead organic or living organic organisms to get their carbon source. So let's combine some of these terms a little bit here now. A photoautotroph. Photoautotroph. So photo referring to the fact that they're utilizing the sun generally as an energy source. Auto meaning they're utilizing gaseous carbon dioxide as a carbon source. So plants are photoautotrophic organisms made up of photoautotrophic cells. Think back to uh, lab. If you've had lab already, you remember looking at algae, I think during week two, or cyanobacteria, right? Those are photosynthetic organisms. And, and we see a photograph of, of that here. They're green because of the chlorophyll and other photosynthetic pigments within the cell that allow that cell to utilize the energy from the sun, the sunshine, and convert it into usable sources. They're also getting their carbon dioxide, if it's a plant, from the air, or if it's, if it's an aquatic organism like this algae is, it's getting the CO2 that's dissolved in the water. Contrast that with a chemoautotrophic organism. What does that mean? Well, autotrophic, again, referring to the fact that it's utilizing carbon dioxide, but the energy source is not the sun, but rather the energy source is from inorganic molecules. Yeah, you gotta think about this a little bit. This is pretty crazy. Well, if you think back to that video you saw in one of the earlier chapters of those deep ocean trench communities that had these smokers, hydrothermal vents that are emanating um, really hot um, substances from the core of the earth, right? Very, very hot, but there are chemicals, there are inorganic chemicals in there that are feeding the archaea that are living in these tube worms. Again, go back and watch that video if you've forgotten. Very important video to watch. And so these prokaryotic cells are getting their energy from the chemicals being given off by the earth. So the earth is really providing the energy. It's kind of interesting. And they're able again to take that, those chemicals, including CO2, and make their own organic compounds. In other, in other words, survive and reproduce. And these are the basis for these fascinating uh, food chains and food webs that we find in these deep hydrothermal vent communities these three meter long tube worms, you know, the, the blind crabs, and just a, a, a myriad of just fascinating creatures that live right at those hydrothermal vents. Pitch black, very cold, except for the emissions here of these, uh, these smokers. You can see some of the tube worms here in, in, per, in uh, orange and white. Okay, these aren't the tube worms here. These are those, those uh, vents. These are the two worms. Um, your book talks a little bit about a group of archaea called the methanogens. These are cells that are able to produce methane. That's what methanol refers to. So we can go not to the deep oceans necessarily to find these, although, although I'm sure they are there. We can go just outside of our homes and go to a nearby swamp or marsh or in the intestines of some animals, including you and I, 
and find a group of prokaryotes that are, again, making use of outside inorganic compounds to generate their own organic substances. And here's a, a scanning electron micrograph of, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the scientific name of this guy, but um, these are, are found again in those hydrothermal vent communities that provide a basis, if you will, again, for the food chain and the amazing ecology uh, of, of these areas. But you find these in other places too. In your gut, especially in the guts of cows, cows are big producers of methane gas. They belch it actually when they chew their cud. And it's due to the anaerobic environment provided in the stomach of the cow that allows these methanogens to grow and do really, really well. Okay, we're going to focus our attention primarily on the chemoheterotrophic organisms because most prokaryotes are chemoheterotrophs. Again, what this gets at is the fact that they are obtaining their carbon from the organic compounds of other organisms. And in order to get the energy, they are basically metabolizing those organic compounds. And some cells can do that aerobically, meaning in the presence of oxygen, and others will be able to do this under anaerobic conditions, of which fermentation is one example of an anaerobic process. Again, think back to ANP1, um, chapter three, I think it was, of, of our textbook that talks about glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport, if you remember those. Yeah, those are, are aerobic processes. We'll review that coming up in a couple more chapters. But your book describes two different categories of chemoheterotrophic types of cells, the saprobes and the parasites. So in this particular example that we see on the right-hand side, which includes many types of bacteria and fungi, again, they are usually obtaining their organic compounds by first secreting enzymes externally. So here we have the enzyme shown in red being actively secreted from the cell. So pretend this is a bacterial bacillus shaped cell. And then the digestion, if you will, occurs extracellularly outside of the cell. And once broken down, those building block monomers are then transported across the cell membrane, across the cell wall and into the cell to be utilized in some way. Okay, so again, the cell is obtaining its carbon and the necessary energy by absorbing food, if you will. Parasitic cells, be they eukaryotic or prokaryotic cells, as you might know, are relying on a host of some sort to get their food. And we talked about different types of pathogens uh, in one of the earlier chapters. Um, think of the eukaryotic trypanosoma or plasmodium. Now those are eukaryotic cells, but nonetheless, they are getting into the body of a host and they're utilizing the nutrients provided to them by the host. And that's the case for pathogenic bacteria too. They cause disease, they cause infection, they cause harm to the host, maybe even death to the host. Um, they are dependent on the host. They cannot survive without getting in and completing their life cycle and obtaining their nutrients. Now, I think this is an interesting thing to ponder here too. It says there that most pathogens, the six most successful ones, do not kill their host because you're, you're, you're you rely on that host to get the food that you need. So by, by killing the host, you've basically limited your food source, haven't you? So when you look at evolution of, of parasitic 
organisms, be they, again, eukaryotic or prokaryotic cells, um, the most successful parasites don't kill their hosts. There's a table in your book um, that I've posted here. I'm not gonna spend time on it, but it's just a nice summary where it describes the differences between, again, a photo, photo autotrophic organism from a chemo autotrophic to a chemo heterotrophic organism. There are even some photo heterotrophic organisms. We won't talk much about them, but they're called purple sulfur bacteria. Um, even some of the green, uh, bacteria can do this too, some of the uh, cyanobacteria, where they're um, utilizing, again, organic carbon, but can do this either via tapping into sunshine or their energy source may come from organic material. That's where the hetero comes into play. So these, these guys are very fascinating, unique. We won't talk much about them. We're going to focus mostly on the chemo heterotrophs, because that makes up by far the majority of prokaryotic cell, um, you know, nutritional, uh, you know, categories. Okay. Um, I am not going to spend a lot of time in this next section, which is section 7.3 entitled transport movement of substances across the cell membrane. You have heard of this. Um, a lot. Uh, we talk about it in ANP. If you've taken high school bio, you've studied this, you should have studied this. So I am not going to lecture on it. I'm going to simply ask that you take some time and you review the difference between passive transport and active transport. Again, I think the slide does a nice job summarizing it. So you can just look at the slide. And then we're going to, uh, the book's going to go into some detail about different types of passive and active transport mechanisms including diffusion, and I've got a video you can watch about that. Osmosis, and there's a video you can watch about that. What's the difference between an isotonic solution, a hypotonic solution, and a hypertonic solution? These relate to water movement, if you remember. Water always moves from a region of higher water concentration to a region of lower water concentration, always. Another way of saying that is water always moves from a lower solute to a higher solute. The solute is the substance being dissolved in the water. Again, if you've got your ANP1 notes, go back and review that. Or if you have your book, go back and review that. Of course, the micro book reviews it as well. But you should remember the differences between those three types of solutions. You should know what happens to a cell if you place it into a hypertonic solution? What happens to it? Does it shrink? Does it uh, blow up? Is it not impacted visually? Does water move in and out at equal rates? So take some time, review what these three solutions are and how they differ from one another. And most importantly, how does a typical cell respond when placed into one of these three types of solutions? This applies, again, to eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Facilitated diffusion. Again, what is that? Spend, spend some time going back and reviewing that. It's not hard. There's a video you can watch. And something called active transport. Should ring a bell from ANP. Take some time. Watch the video. This specifically talks about something called the sodium potassium pump, which you should have learned about in ANP2 and the nervous system. Remember, in eukaryotic cells, upwards of 40% of energy expenditure in a cell is um, performed as a result of active transport. I'm not sure if it's the same percentage for prokaryotes, but I would not be surprised if it is. Um, a lot of what a cell will utilize energy-wise goes into moving substances against the concentration gradient. Absolutely. And again, you can watch that video. Endocytosis. Again, we talked about this in A&P. Take some time. What's the difference between phagocytosis and pinocytosis? Do you remember that? Go back, review that. 
And let's talk next about some environmental factors that impact microbial cells. Now this first term that you're seeing there in red is a term that I often associate with uh, ecology actually, because we often talk about the niche or niche, some people pronounce it, of an organism. So this is a very broad um, description or definition, which can be applied to birds, to uh, leopards, to elephants, to fish, to fungi, to you and me, or to bacteria or prokaryotic cells. Every living organism, be they single-celled or multi-celled organisms, have to have a particular niche or niche. And this can be a very difficult term to sort of try to define or to, to list all the possible adaptations that an organism makes in its environment. It varies from organism to organism, and it's through that evolutionary process that an organism's niche is sort of defined. We're going to think of a prokaryotic cell's niche or niche as being impacted by a number of different factors that you see listed here, these five bullets we're gonna spend some time talking about for the remainder of this first lecture. And I want, as we look at these five different factors, I want you to always be thinking about the impact that they have on the cell's enzymes. Now remember, enzymes are proteins. Enzymes help reactions go faster and more efficiently. Enzymes are catalysts. They lower the E sub A. Do you know what that is? The E sub A is the energy of activation. Okay, all cells strive to be as efficient as they can through evolutionary processes. They don't wanna expend any more energy than they absolutely need to. And one way to lower the energy expenditure needs is to reduce the energy of activation of reactions. And enzymes do a significantly important thing there in helping to reduce the E sub A of most all metabolic reactions. It's called the energy of activation. Again, AMP1, we talk about that. If you manipulate the environmental conditions of cells, there can be a time, a temperature, a pH, and so forth that can be reached that will negatively impact these enzymes and how they function. And if the enzyme can't function properly, it's going to really have a bad impact on the cell. If it can't metabolize materials, if it can't break down big organic compounds into smaller ones or take smaller substances and build them up into bigger, more complex ones, right? That's what metabolism really is. It's, it's catabolism and anabolism combined. Again, AMP1. Cells are gonna have major issues. So let's talk about temperature first. All microbial cells have a minimum temperature that they can survive at, that they can grow at. Makes sense the term minimum, minimum temperature. This is a photograph I took just the other day. There was this bizarre uh, icicle hanging down from the gutter of our sunroom. And um, I wanted to try to capture a droplet, which I, I did, uh, luckily. Um, there are some bacteria that can actually do quite well at temperatures close to 32 degrees, which is of course when where, where water turns into ice, turns into solid. There are some bacteria that if we want to grow, we put them in the refrigerator. That's the incubator. You might be scratching your head thinking, well, I didn't. I thought when we wanted to slow their growth down, we put them in the fridge. Well, that's true. For the majority of bacteria that we work with in lab, if we want to arrest or stop the growth, we put them in the fridge. But there are some bacteria that actually would view that particular cold environment, four degrees Celsius, as being an optimal temperature. And we'll see that in just a few minutes. So just think again, lowest range of 
a particular bacterial um, cell to survive in, the minimum temperature. And of course, we have the maximum, the highest temperature whereby the microbe can still grow and undergo anabolism and catabolism, which again is metabolism. The big issue that we often run into is if we exceed the maximum temperature of a cell, a microorganism, a bacterium, for example, what we end up often seeing is that the proteins and the nucleic acids of the cell begin to denature. And I hope you remember what that word means. What is denaturation? I'm not gonna define it. If you don't remember, look it up. You should remember what denaturation is. I'll give you a hint. The structure influences the function. And then sandwiched somewhere between the minimum and the maximum would be an optimal or optimum temperature that defines the best temperature where that microbe is the happiest, where it grows the fastest, its metabolism is, is at its peak. Those are important terms to kind of understand. Let's put that in a graphical format and talk a little bit about some categories that define various temperature regimes that, that cells like to live in. And so you see here, uh, color-coded, psychrophilic bacteria like it cold. Mesophilic bacteria like it sort of in the mid-range. And thermophilic bacteria, or I'll say prokaryotes, because we could talk about archaea here too, like it hot. So again, look at the prefix. You can kind of hopefully glean from that what the basic temperature preference preferences are. So remember I said a moment ago how some like it in the fridge. Well, those are the psychrophilic bacteria whose optimal growth is just above zero degrees Celsius. Now you should know what zero Celsius is in Fahrenheit. You should know that. If you don't know that, look it up. Commit it to memory. You should know what zero Celsius is in Fahrenheit. And I'm suggesting to you that there are some bacteria that are able to grow, maybe slower, but are nonetheless able to grow at temperatures of minus five or minus 10, or even in extreme examples of minus 15 Celsius. Not optimum, but they can still survive and, and their, their, their growth is slow, but they're able to survive. Compare and contrast that with, of course, the, the mesophilic bacteria, which I've shown here in, in uh, green. Those pretty much typify the types of microbes that we're most concerned with with respect to pathogenicity in humans, because our body temperature, as you know, is 37 Celsius. There it is, which provides an optimum temperature for mesophiles. Well, they can survive lower than 37. They can survive a little bit higher than 37. Although notice the curve is not as broad as you go uh, you know, higher than the optimum. That's the case for actually all of these. They're more cold tolerant than they are heat tolerant. Um, and then finally, the thermophilic bacteria or prokaryotes liking it hot with the hyperthermophile shown here sort of in brown. So these would be the ones that we saw when we went to Yellowstone a couple of weeks ago, right? In the Grand Prismatic Spring or in the uh, Old Faithful or in some of those um, mud pots that were bubbling really, 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 really hot. But those bacteria, those prokaryotes, those archaea, love it, hot. Notice. Zero degrees Celsius, or I'm sorry, 100 degrees Celsius. Boiling point of water, what is that in Fahrenheit? You should know that number. I'm suggesting to you that there are some hyperthermophiles that like it and are, are uh, preferring temperatures around 125 Celsius. There's the autoclave, 121. These guys love it hotter than that. Now, there aren't a whole lot of those, but there are prokaryotes in existence that love it hot. Pretty interesting. And again, we can just think of the deep, hydro, deep ocean hydrothermal vent communities, right? Super hot, super, super, super hot. There's where you'd find those hyperthermophilic bacteria. 
Oxygen, another environmental factor that can play a role in defining um, growth characteristics of prokaryotes. And as we may know, um, many cells require oxygen to survive. We call them aerobes. We'll be defining that in just a few moments. But this is not getting at the oxygen needs of the cell, okay? This is talking about how a prokaryotic cell is able to take oxygen and utilize it in a way that allows it to break down the oxygen into forms that will not hurt the cell. Because as it turns out, when you look at, at oxygen gas and the role it plays um, biochemically within cells, oftentimes what is produced are compounds like you see here listed, singlet oxygen, superoxide ions and, and peroxide, and these hydro, hydroxyl radical uh, ions. These can prove to be toxic to cells. And I won't go into the reasons for that, but, but certain forms of oxygen are toxic to cells. Probably didn't even know that or ever hear that, but, but that's true. So what some pro prokaryotic cells, some bacteria have to do is be able to neutralize these rather toxic byproducts of oxygen. And they can do that, many of them. And so you'll be learning about this in lab in a couple of weeks. You'll be learning about catalase and the role this enzyme plays in breaking down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. If the cell, for example, did not have the means to produce this enzyme, hydrogen peroxide could kill the cell. And some cells do die in the presence of hydrogen peroxide. Um, so many microbes have this ability to, to synthesize, produce their own enzymes, to neutralize the toxic uh, forms of oxygen. And if you are unable to do that, then as a prokaryotic cell, you likely are an anaerobe. You live in an environment where there is no oxygen because remember, if you can't break down those toxic end products of oxygen, you're gonna die. So evolution has basically allowed these cells to survive in totally anaerobic environments. And then they don't have to worry about producing those enzymes because there's no oxygen there to worry about that could, could prove toxic to them. So let's define a couple of these um, categories. Again, this will be very useful to you as we get into lab because we'll be using these words um, quite often. Not all of them, but many of them. You've already heard me use the term aerobe. So this is a cell that's going to use oxygen in its metabolism and has the necessary uh, enzymes to detoxify those various nasty toxic forms. So your cells are aerobic. Many bacterial cells are aerobic. We're, we're gonna also uh, talk about a special category of aerobe, and we use the term strict or obligate in front of that word, meaning that the cell is obligated to live in an environment with ample oxygen. Without any oxygen or without ample oxygen, the cell cannot grow. So it's obligated to have plenty of aerobic environment there. Now you might say, what's the difference between aerobe and strict aerobe? Well, as we'll look to see in this third category, facultative is um, referring here to an anaerobe, meaning that some cells can survive in the presence or absence of oxygen. Okay, ordinarily, 
a facultative anaerobe is one that would prefer an anaerobic environment. Just like aerobes generally prefer adequate oxygen. This one here, strict or obligate, means you have to have plenty of oxygen. Without oxygen, the cells die. But facultative, which can actually be used, this term can be used in front of anaerobe or aerobe, gets to the point of flexibility within the cell. This anaerobe would prefer anaerobic environments, but in the presence of oxygen can still survive and even grow. And we can have facultative aerobes. We just don't put the term facultative in front of it, which means they would prefer oxygen, but can survive in, in diminished O2 environments. Microaerophilic. Philic means what? Philic? Loving. So these guys like a little bit, a small micro amount of oxygen. So likes little oxygen. So it is going to not thrive in a fully oxygenated environment. It's one, it wants just a little bit of oxygen. Um, again, anaerobic, meaning it's not utilizing oxygen. We can have strict or obligate anaerobes, just like we, had, we can have strict and obligate aerobes. So what this gets at is any oxygen whatsoever could prove detrimental to this cell. It has to have a strictly or it's obligated to live in a totally anaerobic world. Because if there's any oxygen introduced, those various toxic waste or end products that we talked about earlier cannot be broken down by the cell because it lacks those enzymes. And so oxygen or byproducts of oxygen will, would basically kill the strict anaerobe. Aerotolerant anaerobes, as the name sort of applies or, or mentions here, it likes or not even likes, it tolerates oxygen but it would prefer an anaerobic environment. So you might you know, kind of wonder what's the difference between aerotolerant anaerobe and facultative anaerobe. They're, they're really, really similar. I would say that the aerotolerant um, you know, just doesn't prefer oxygen. It doesn't grow well in, um, in a lot of oxygen presence in the environment. It, it can survive and grow, but it doesn't utilize oxygen very much at all. A facultative anaerobe can actually utilize oxygen. So we have different ways of growing bacteria anaerobically. And one particular medium that we used to use in micro lab, we, we haven't used it in the last couple semesters because we've had mixed results using it. Uh, it's called thioglycolate medium. It comes as a broth. Um, and what's really cool about thioglycolate, um, sometimes called fluid thioglycolate medium, is the fact that it's prepared in a way such that at the air, water, water or broth interface, we have aerobic conditions, but as you proceed down into the broth, it becomes more and more and more and more anaerobic, okay? So when you inoculate fluid thioglycolate media with a bacterium and look for its growth pattern, you can assess based upon where, the, where it grows, what its oxygen or anaerobic needs might be. So look on the four tubes here. Here we have a bacterium whose scientific name is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We'll be working with this coming up in a couple of weeks. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an aerobe. It will only grow here where there's adequate oxygen concentration toward the very, 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 very top of the, of the broth. However, Staph aureus and E. coli, and I think you've heard of certainly E. coli, notice that E. coli is growing 
all throughout the entire tube. So we would define E. coli as a facultative anaerobe, meaning it can survive in very anaerobic conditions, but it can also survive if there's oxygen there too. Okay, because we can see there's growth here at the top, just like there was here with the pseudomonas. And in the case of Staph aureus, it is one that doesn't like it too anaerobic because there's obviously no growth down here, or well, I shouldn't say no growth. There's a little bit of growth, but not a whole heck of a lot. It's much cloudier in the top 50%, isn't it, of this broth, and quite a bit here at the very uh, interface of the liquid and the gas. So it's, it's sort of facultative anaerobic as well, um, not quite so much as E. coli is, but it can survive in the presence and absence of oxygen. And then here we've got Clostridium that is a strict or obligate anaerobe. How do we know that? Well, again, look at the top of the broth where it's totally clear. There's no growth at all. But we have ample growth once we get you know, beyond this, this pattern of clear into cloudy. So oxygen would be toxic to Clostridium. Just can't grow there. It doesn't have the means to detoxify those, those oxygen-based compounds. Would kill it. Um, and there are certain laboratories, uh, like you see these two technicians working in, and they seem to be inoculating what, what appears to be some blood auger plates. Um, they're working in a hood that has special um, characteristics, if you will, that keep keeps all oxygen out. And they are probably maybe doing some streak plating, it looks like. Um, so these are special growing conditions, special inoculating conditions um, that some particular bacteria might require. So the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, for example, and maybe some research laboratories would have these sorts of, of uh, facilities to allow uh, a very um, strict regulation of the oxygen growing uh, capabilities or just oxygen levels, if you will, in those environments where the inoculating is taking place. Carbon dioxide, we often think of that as a waste product of cells, and certainly it is, but you may not realize that some microorganisms actually like having elevated CO2 levels in their environment when they're, where they're growing. When you look at the CO2 level in the air that you're breathing right now in, in the room, it's about 0.03%, making up about 0.03% of the gases in the air that you're breathing. It's very, very low. Okay, compare that to the oxygen levels, which is about 21% of the air in the, in, in the room that you're breathing right now, it's about 21% oxygen. So, it's, it's, less, it's less than 0.1% CO2. Some bacteria do fine in that low CO2 level, but there are some called campnophilic that like it very much elevated, much, much higher than it would be in, in, the, in the normal atmosphere. So we're talking about something here that is what, 100 times or you know, over a thousand times the normal CO2 level as you as you'd find it in the room in the atmosphere. Yeah. And so in order to grow these so-called campnophilic bacteria, we make use of special growing chambers. Now we could we could go back to the previous slide and talk about the CDC and all that stuff. So they they have bigger facilities obviously to grow these. But in our laboratory, we're going to be making use of what are called gas packs. And toward the end of the semester in lab, we'll be plating some bacteria, and we'll be putting them into these um, special uh, chambers. And we'll be adding um, some envelopes here that will generate higher than normal levels of CO2. We'll also take the oxygen actually out of the, uh, out of the space here as well in order to promote the growth of both strict anaerobes as well as some of these campnophilic types. But again, these would require special growth chambers. You could never grow campnophiles, you know, in anything but special growth conditions because it's not got a high enough CO2 level. 
pH is another environmental factor that can certainly regulate and influence where bacteria are going to grow. Um, you remember the pH scale goes from 0 to 14. 7 is neutral. 0 is the most acidic. 14 is the most basic or alkaline. Most of the bacteria that we work with in lab are neutrophils, meaning that they like it in the neutral pH, somewhere between 6 and 8, 7, of course, being neutral right in the middle. Acidophilic, as the name implies, likes it very acidic. So you think about the bacteria that live in your stomach, for example, pH of 2. There are some bacteria that do very, very well and love it in your stomach. Um, we have some, as it mentions here in the slide, that can survive near, near the theoretical limit of, of pH. You can't get anything lower than a pH 0. But there are some that are straddling that most pH environment, most acidic pH ever created. That's pretty crazy that they can do that. Um, the alkalinophilic bacteria or alkalinophiles, philic means to love, like it alkaline. They like it basic. And um, this is a series of photographs taken from a place in California, in uh, Eastern California called Mono Lake. And it has some amazing geologic structures here that are formed due to some of the alkaline deposits uh, within this lake. And it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. We were going to go visit there a couple of years ago, but unfortunately COVID-19 put, a, put that, a kibosh on that trip, but we were going to head out to Death Valley and uh, Yosemite, some of those places. And Mono Lake, I just happened to see on the map was was very near some of those spots we were going to visit. It would have been fun to go to Mono Lake to see um, this very inhospitable uh, lake. But nonetheless, there are alkalinophiles that do quite well at a very, very high pH. Osmotic pressure, this gets at the movement of water in or out of cells. So remember I said not too long ago that I want you to know the difference between hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic solutions and what effect they have on cells, right? So what this is getting at is the unique ability that some prokaryotic cells have in surviving very, very high salt environments. In other words, very high hypertonic concentrations. Most, most bacteria can survive isotonically, or survive, I should say, in isotonic solutions uh, and to a, to a lesser extent in hypotonic solutions, typically hypertonic would result in crenation of the cell as they lost water. But here we see an example of an extreme halophilic environment here in a place uh, in Antarctica called Don Juan Pond. It's kind of a funny name, but this is on the edge of a glacier. And uh, we've got a, a solar panel here that's powering a, a camera that's monitoring the lake. Um, and notice the salinity level here at 34% almost. This is so high a salt concentration, it's absolutely astounding that anything can grow. But nonetheless, they've found halophiles in this most salty environment on Earth. And there, there are researchers that are going there, sampling this, this uh, pond um, during the times of the year when they can get there, uh, although it's generally pretty dry. Um, that's just absolutely astounding. This photograph on the right uh, is an aerial, aerial view of some halophilic ponds. Uh, I believe this is out in California as well. And these colors that you see here are not photoshopped, OK? The green and the purple and the red and the yellow and the orange. These are the color of the bacteria, the, the uh, prokaryotes, that are living in these salt water ponds. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. They have evolved the means to survive. And as we learned about in one of the recent chapters, I think it was the, the tools of the micro lab, we talked a little bit about this type of auger called mannitol salt auger. Remember, we described the fact that Staph aureus is one of those that likes it salty. Yeah, and if you grow Staph aureus in mannitol salt, which has an elevated 
sodium chloride concentration, upwards of 20% even, so that's awful salty. Um, it does very well and will turn the agar from the normal kind of pink uh, violet to yellow. This is the actual color so, that you're going to get here. Um, the uninoculated would be this color. Um, Staph epidermidis, a close cousin of aureus, again, is not able to me metabolize the salts. It can grow in mannitol salt agar. You can see the streak plate if you look really close, the various zones. Um, but because it's not able to, me to metabolize the salt and convert it, uh, you don't see a color change to, to yellow. Um, so we, re we would refer to you know, things like Staph aureus as being osmotolerant in, a, in their ability to survive a wide range of salty growing conditions. And finally, barophilic bacteria. This gets at pressure. Now you know that an autoclave is generally used to sterilize the vast majority of media and, and other uh, things we've been growing bacteria in, right? Be they broths or slants or plates. When Deb's done with those, she will autoclave them to sterilize them so that she can dispose of them properly. And the autoclave, remember, was utilizing temperatures of about 121 Celsius um, at, a, at a pressure of about 15 PSI, if you recall, for 15 to 20 minutes with the time frame. We're suggesting here that there are bacteria, prokaryotic cells, that can survive extreme pressure, much, much higher than what you'd encounter in an autoclave. So going back to those deep ocean hydrothermal vent communities that we've been talking about so darn much, or in very, very deep parts of the ocean, the pressures are so high that most cells would just be zapped immediately. Yet these barophilic bacteria and even some prokary and even some eukaryotic uh, cells, these foraminifera, these are eukaryotic. Um, they're they're able to survive extremely high pressures. And there's a, a link here of, to an article that talks about some of these organisms that live in excess of 11,000 meters in depth. So convert that into feet, as you see here. We're talking 36,000 feet. This is this is deeper than Mount Everest is high. I mean, it's absolutely mind-boggling how deep this is, and the pressures that exist there are crushing. But bacteria have survived, uh, have evolved the means to survive at those pressures. So that's that's pretty cool. Okay, here's a little concept que question you can answer. We actually talked about uh, watermelon snow back in chapter one. How would you describe these eukaryotes that grow on Alaskan glaciers? Sacrophilic, alkalinophilic, microaerophile, osmotolerant, or barophilic? Well, this is talking about temperature, isn't it, where it's cold? So, sacrophile. Okay, we're going to stop here. And in the second half of the chapter seven lecture, um, we'll get into some interesting ecological um, relationships that involve microbes. So get into chapter seven, start reading.